Good afternoon. My name is Mike Tu. With me is Jenny Domino, and we will be moderating this afternoon's discussion. We begin our forum with remarks from the Dean of the University of the Philippines College of Law, Dean Edgardo Carlo Vistan II. Dean Vistan teaches law practicum, constitutional law, civil procedure, special proceedings, among others, at the college. He obtained from UP his Bachelor of Science degree in Molecular Biology and Biotechnology cum laude and his Bachelor of Laws cum laude, graduating valedictorian of his class. Dean Vistan obtained his Master of Laws degree from Yale Law School in 2017 and is a current Doctor of Juridical Science candidate at the same university. Dean Vistan, good afternoon. Thank you, Mike, and hello, everyone. Welcome to this forum on crimes against humanity and the International Criminal Court. Through the initiatives of the UP Law Center's Institute of Human Rights and Institute of International Legal Studies, we have this opportunity to learn about the relevance to our country, and it would seem our day-to-day -day lives as well, of the international legal institutions just mentioned. Several decades ago, many of the concepts and possibilities we will hear about in a few minutes would have been farthest from the minds of even those who immerse themselves in these subjects. While some at that time may have contemplated a permanent international tribunal that would dispense an international version of criminal justice and thereby prevent impunity for grave offenses to the international community, it would be difficult to imagine the notion that such an institution would be dealing with events that happened in a non-conflict or non-war setting in typical Filipino neighborhoods. And while most Filipinos went about their affairs in relative peace, but that, is, but that is precisely the notion or the possibility that we will be tackling this afternoon. As, as I further reflected on the topics, I also realized that we have become in recent years a nation that tends to run to international institutions for help. Some of the burning issues of the day, such as the West Philippine Sea dispute and the topic we will be discussing in this session are results of relatively recent recourse to outside institutions. Why this is so, whether other countries and cultures would do the same, and whether this trend is a good thing or otherwise are topics for another day. I do want to point out this observation as my small contribution to this afternoon's discussion, a contribution by way of a perspective from which to evaluate the information and views we will be hearing in a few moments. Joining us in this forum are experts and practitioners in various fields, many of whom are joining us from other time zones. I welcome and thank my private international law professor, Elizabeth Mambeth Aguiling Pangalangan, my persons and family relations professor, Ruben Carranza, Dr. Socorro Reyes of the Center for Legislative Development, and Professor Raj Palacios of the UP College of Law. Thank you all for agreeing to join us and share your knowledge and perspectives. Mambet Pangalangan, of course, is the director of the Institute of Human Rights of the UP Law Center, one of the organizers of this event. Attorney Roben Carranza, on the other hand, is a senior expert at the International Center for Transitional Justice. Dr. Socorro Reyes is a regional governance advisor of the Center for Legislative Development. Professor Raj Palacios, in turn, is the chairman of the International Law and International Affairs Committee of the Integrated Bar of the Philippines, which is an institutional partner of the UP College of Law for this event. I also welcome and thank our IBP president, Attorney Domingo Egon Cayosa, whom we will hear from later in the program. Finally, of course, I welcome my dean for most of my law school days, Judge Raul Pangalangan. After a successful tenure as judge of the International Criminal Court, 
Judge Pangalangan officially rejoined the faculty of the UP College of Law last month. I happily note that the lecture that Judge Pangalangan would be giving to us would publicly mark a return to his work as a scholar and professor in our academic community. Judge Raul will be lecturing on topics on which, in my estimation, no other Filipino would be able to speak on with the expertise and perspective of one who served as magistrate of the International Criminal Court. This is truly a very special location and learning experience. And for that, we thank you, Judge Raul. While I have sent Judge Pangalangan messages of congratulations for what he has accomplished with the International Criminal Court, let me congratulate you again, Judge Pangalangan, in this public, albeit virtual event. I hope that soon enough, we can all welcome and congratulate you while shaking your hand. I know that the rest of the UP College of Law community and our audience join me in this sentiment. I can also feel that they join me in eagerly anticipating your lecture, so let me delay that no longer. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us in this forum. I wish you all a pleasant and fruitful learning experience ahead. Thank you very much for the opening remarks, Dean Vistan. Our next speaker is Professor Elizabeth Agiling Pangalangan, who will frame today's discussion. Professor Elizabeth Agiling Pangalangan is a full professor at the UP College of Law, where she has taught persons and family relations, private international law, child's rights, and contracts, among others, and is the director of the UP Institute of Human Rights. She obtained her Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of, of Laws degrees from the University of the Philippines and her Master of Laws from Harvard Law School, where she was later a visiting scholar and research fellow. She was recently a visiting lecturer at Leiden University Law School, the Netherlands, and is a member of the experts group on parentage and surrogacy of the Hague Conference of Private International Law. At present, she serves as the president of the Philippine Society of International Law. Professor Beth, the floor is yours. Good, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Thank you for the kind introduction, Jen. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and good afternoon for some. Less than two weeks ago, then outgoing chief prosecutor of the ICC, Fatou Ben Souda, filed a public request for a full probe on President Duterte's war on drugs. She stated that on the basis of the preliminary examination process undertaken by her office since February 2018, there is reasonable basis to believe that the crime against humanity of murder has been committed in the Philippines from July 1, 2016 and March 16, 2019. President Duterte has been adamant in his refusal to cooperate with the ICC citing the country's withdrawal from the Rome Statute in 2019 and claiming that the ICC assertion of jurisdiction over the case is legally erroneous. This has since brought forth questions on the nature of crimes against humanity, the authority and capacity of the ICC to investigate, and its role in the protection of human rights in seeking justice for the victims of EJ case and in ending impunity. Unfortunately, there is a lack of accessible discussions on the intricacies of this topic, exacerbated by the misinformation the ICC sowed either out of ignorance or in a deliberate effort to muddle the issues. It is in this light of the Philippines becoming a situation country that the Institute of Human Rights and the Institute of International Legal Studies, both of the UP Law Center, in partnership with the Integrated Bar of the Philippines, have organized this forum aimed at providing the public with a clearer picture of the nature of crimes against humanity and its implications on the efforts to seek effective remedies, both for the victims and the Filipino people. Today's forum is in line with our mandate to, and I quote, contribute to the improvement of the legal system and the quality and administration of injustice, a system of justice in our society for the full protection of human rights, end of quote. 
with this forum, we trust that we will be able to contribute to the vision of an informed and empowered citizenry in pursuit of restoring in our country the rule of law, which in the simplest terms means that the law applies to all from the most powerful officials to those at every rung of the social economic ladder. With this forum, we hope to unpack the basic elements of the ICC procedures involved and provide a broader perspective about what this means for the Philippines. We are thus grateful for the presence of our esteemed speaker, Judge Raul C. Pangalangan, with his firsthand experience as recently retired judge and former president of the Child Division of the International Criminal Court, he will be discussing the nature of crimes against humanity and the procedural framework for its prosecution. We're also thankful for the presence of our expert panelists who will provide additional valuable insights on the issue. UP Law Professor Andre Palacios, who is also chairperson of the IBP International Law and International Affairs Committee, will be discussing the Philippine legal implications of an ICC investigation. He will be followed by attorney Ruben Carranza, a senior expert at the International Center for Transitional Justice, who will discuss victim participation and reparations. Last but not least, Dr. Socorro Reyes, Regional Governance Advisor at the Center for Legislative Development, will discuss what is at stake for the families left behind by EGK victims. So on behalf of the organizers, uh, the Institute of Human Rights, the Institute of International Legal Studies, and the IBP, I look forward to a fruitful discussion today and thank our forum participants for their interest. Good day to everyone. Thank you, Professor Beth. At this point, we call Attorney Joan Paula de Vera Turda, the Assistant Editor of the Asia Pacific Journal of International Humanitarian Law with the UP Institute of International Legal Studies to introduce our main lecturer this afternoon. Attorney Paula. Our main lecturer is His Excellency Judge Raul C. Pangalangan. Judge Pangalangan is the first Filipino to serve as a judge of the International Criminal Court. While in the ICC, Judge Pangalangan was elected by his colleagues to be the president of the trial division. He was also presiding judge in the landmark case of the prosecutor versus Ahmad Al-Faki Al-Madi and was most recently a member of the trial chamber that decided the case of the prosecutor versus Dominic Ongwen on child soldiers and sexual slavery. Judge Pangalangan is professor of law and former law dean of the University of the Philippines, specializing in constitutional law and public international law. He obtained his LLM, winning the Lenin Prize in International Law, and SJD, winning the Sumner Prize for Best Dissertation on International Peace in Harvard University. He has taught at the Hague Academy of International Law and as visiting professor at Harvard Law School. Here to give a lecture on the nature of crimes against humanity and the procedural elements of its prosecution is His Excellency Judge Raul C. Pangalangan. Thank Thank you so much, uh, Paula, for the kind um, introduction. I thank the, the organizers, the UP Institute of Human Rights and the Institute of International Legal Studies, together with the uh, Integrated Bar of the Philippines for organizing this forum on such quick notice. It is an, a quick and agile response, stepping forward to foster informed public debate on the legal issues of the, uh, of the day. My assigned topic focuses both on the substance and the procedure of the relevant law. And I would like uh, within my, my limited time to jump straight to the, the, the procedure, to the matter of procedure. Uh, what is the procedural stance of the case at the moment? If you recall, in February 2018, the prosecutor of the court <clears throat> opened a preliminary examination. So I'm, we're starting with a jargon here. It is called a preliminary examination, distinct from the investigation. And the examination was into the, it is called the situation in the Philippines, involving crimes allegedly committed since at least 1 July 2016 in the context of the war on drugs campaign launched by the government of the Philippines. That is the, um, 
uh, the, the, the action by the, by the ICC prosecutor by which the Philippines then becomes a, what we call a situation country. So notice the examination is on, at, at this stage, at that stage, uh, uh, the alleged crimes being committed within the terri of, territory of the Philippines. So the question is, what is now pending before the pretrial chamber of the court? It is actually the result of that preliminary examination. And um, so on 24 June, the prosecutor made public her request, which was dated actually May 24, uh, a request for authorization for an investigation. So notice, at this stage, the prosecutor is merely asking the pretrial chamber for permission to proceed to an investigation. Now, let, let me explain uh, what, what that means. Uh, you see, um, the, uh, the prosecutor is not always required uh, to go before the pretrial chamber to ask permission to proceed with an investigation. There are three ways by which cases are commenced uh, in, the, um, uh, in the ICC. Uh, sometimes uh, it can, it, the three ways are the first, a referral from another member state. The second is a referral from the UN Security Council. And the third, which is the one applicable in, in the case we are discussing today, uh, an action by the prosecutor, motu proprio, on her own. Um, and uh, for the first two, modes, we call them the, the trigger mechanisms for ICC jurisdiction. There is no such requirement for seeking permission before a pretrial chamber. The prosecutor, once the referral is made, can proceed directly to investigate. So why is it that for the actions motu proprio, the prosecutor has to go before an, uh, a pretrial uh, chamber? The reason goes back to the drafting history of the, of the Rome Statute. The concern was that of an overpowerful uh, prosecutor, a prosecutor uh, that must, uh, whose discretion must therefore be subordinated to uh, some form of, of a judicial check. And this, we call it an Article 15 request. Uh, this power under our, this uh, uh, procedure under Article 15 of the Rome Statute is what we are uh, going through um, uh, today, by which the um, ICC uh, uh, prosecutor, uh, having decided to, uh, that she is satisfied that the requirements uh, for the filing, for the, uh, to begin a prosecution, uh, an investigation, that those requirements have been satisfied, will now ask a pretrial chamber to affirm her, um, her decision. Now, um, let us just review what it means to say that the prosecutor has decided to proceed to this Article uh, 15 request. It means that she has looked at the temporal uh, jurisdiction whether the matter was, uh, whether the situation that she will look into um, falls within the, the, the period which the court, over which the court has, has jurisdiction. And she has phrased it in her request as uh, the period between, for all crimes committed from at least one July, 2016, to March 16, 2019. So notice the end of that period is the, uh, the, that is the moment when the Philippine withdrawal from the Rome Statute took effect. And therefore she's uh, making sure that she is looking uh, only into cases, only into um, matters which arose while the Philippines was a party to the statute. Uh, she will also look into um, uh, the, the, the jurisdictional nexus uh, in the court, 
uh, in the Rome Statute, the court has jurisdiction, uh, provided there is what we call either a territorial nexus, the, um, the, the alleged crimes were committed within the territory of a member state, and the second is a nationality nexus, that it was committed by a national of that, of that state. I, I don't think that is uh, contested um, uh, in, the, um, in the current case um, being uh, uh, sought by the, by the uh, prosecutor. Um, I'll just run through um, uh, the, um, the other requirements. Um, uh, well, when the court eventually proceeds, assuming that the, the pretrial chamber approves a, a grant's request, then the pretrial chamber will be able to consider the elements of complementarity, whether um, uh, the, um, uh, the state which has jurisdiction to prosecute the crimes, namely the Philippines, has been uh, unwilling or unable genuinely to prosecute the, the case. Uh, the court, the pretrial chamber will look at the question of gravity. That is the scale, nature, manner, and impact of any potential cases that might be that might result from the investigation. And finally, again, uh, when the uh, pretrial chamber uh, moves on the case, it will look at what we call, the rubric is whether the prosecution will serve the interests of justice, taking into account the gravity of the crime and the interests of, of victims. Um, uh, please note that a, um, a cornerstone of the Rome Statute is uh, its focus on the victims, both in terms of victim um, uh, reparations and also in terms of victim participation. And um, in fact, if uh, you go to the, um, to the court's website, there is um, already a, um, uh, a note about the, um, a, um, a call for, for the victims to, um, to step forward uh, in, the, in the case, but that is in the website of the, of the court. Um, okay, so that is where we stand today. There is a pending uh, request under Article 15, whether or not the prosecutor can then proceed to the formal investigation of the, uh, of the case. So what do we expect from the pretrial chamber? Uh, it can either deny permission saying that um, it, is, it is not satisfied that the requirements have been met, or it can grant permission after which the, um, the prosecutor then proceeds to investigate. So what are the requirements? What will it take for the pretrial chamber to proceed to grant permission to proceed with the investigation? The statutory requirements are, and uh, notice uh, these are the, the uh, verbatim requirements, reasonable basis to proceed with an investigation and that the case appears to fall within the jurisdiction of the court. And um, the, um, this has been characterized in earlier cases decided by the court as the lowest evidentiary threshold, a reasonable basis to proceed. And in other cases, the wording is a reasonable basis to believe that crimes within the jurisdiction of the court have been committed or are being committed. And um, the explanation for this evidentiary standard is that the highest stand standard, which is proof beyond a reasonable doubt to be established by the uh, prosecutor and uh, the uh, defendant enjoying the presumption of innocence. That is the highest standard which will be applied at the trial stage. This is just at the pretrial chamber. And the, um, uh, uh, the requirement that is uh, imposed by the, by the statute is rather minimal because all it wants to satisfy uh, is that the, um, um, the, the prosecutor uh, is constrained in her decision whether to investigate or not to investigate. Um, okay, also it is at this stage where the victims may make representations before the, uh, before the pretrial 
um, chamber. Um, okay. Uh, there is the question, does the affected state have the right to participate in the Article 15 uh, proceeding? Um, well, strictly speaking, the, uh, the statute does not confer any rights of participation on the state with which would normally exercise jurisdiction over, over the alleged crimes. In other words, at this stage of the proceeding, it is basically a matter between the prosecutor and the, uh, the victims if they uh, uh, want to present their case before the, uh, before the pretrial chamber. Under Article 18 of the statute, the state acquires rights of participation only after the prosecutor initiates a formal investigation following authorization by the pretrial chamber. In other words, the state comes in when the um, pretrial chamber says, okay, prosecutor, you now have our permission to proceed to a formal investigation. And then uh, the, um, the state will be uh, uh, notified and can present its case before the pretrial chamber in the course of that um, investigation. Um, the, um, uh, the other concern, of course, uh, <clears throat> is that um, is the safety of the, um, of the um, victims and the, um, um, and the um, witnesses. Now, <clears throat> there is the recurring question There is the recurring question of the effect of the uh, withdrawal of the, um, of the Philippines. And um, you see, the Philippines signed the Rome Statute um, in 2011. And um, when we signed the statute, we agreed to the terms laid down in the statute. And Article um, 127 of the statute says that the court retains jurisdiction even after withdrawal, it retains jurisdiction over all crimes committed in its territory while it was still a member of the, um, of the Rome statute. And therefore, um, for me, that uh, question is um, uh, fully satisfied by article 27, it was established uh, the principle was applied in an earlier case, the Burundi uh, case. I was a member of the, um, of the pretrial chamber um, at that uh, time, one of the first cases I dealt with um, as a new judge um, um, in the court. And therefore, um, when the court and when the prosecutor here asserts her jurisdiction over uh, uh, crimes committed while the Philippines was still a member of the Rome Statute, that is, uh, until 16 March uh, 2019. Um, she is um, uh, squarely um, invoking the application of Article 127. Um, okay, let me now proceed uh, in the second half of my allotted uh, time. Uh, let me now proceed to the, to substan to the substantive uh, rules. Um, the, uh, the prosecutor in her request for permission specifies one crime, that is the, uh, the crime of humanity of murder. In the latter part of her request, she mentions that it is possible that another crime, which is torture, might have been committed and asks if she can look into the, um, uh, also into such cases. And in the past, Normally, when a pretrial chamber grants permission, the, uh, uh, we call it the PTC, pretrial chamber. The PTC typically will give um, some latitude to the, uh, to the prosecutor because uh, the prosecutor needs uh, some space to look into the relevant facts in order to, um, uh, uh, to present in the end the, um, the indictments. Okay. Um, First, in terms of the point of time, 
when assuming that the prosecutor receives permission to proceed to, uh, to the investigation, the end result will be a, um, the filing of the indictments. What we call in the Philippines, the filing of the information. And in the court, we use as the, a, the most neutral term possible, neutral between the civil law guys and the, uh, the common law guys, the document containing the charges. Even those charges will be subject to a review by the, uh, by the pretrial um, uh, chamber. And once uh, confirmed, when, once there is a confirmation of charges, then a, a trial chamber is formed, uh, which will then proceed to, to try the case. So let us just focus on the, the main uh, uh, crime for which the prosecutor wishes uh, to launch an investigation. You see, when you look at the substance of crimes in the uh, governing law of the ICC, you have to look at two documents, the statute and a separate instrument that we call the elements of crimes. Um, the, um, uh, the statute define, identifies murder as a crime against humanity and includes what we call the chapeau requirements, a requirement that applies to the, to the list of, of, um, of 11 uh, crimes against humanity. And the requirements is, is that it should be acts committed as part of a widespread or systematic attack directed against any civilian population, comma, with knowledge of the attack. And in law, we call the, that last part, the mens rea uh, requirement. The elements of that, uh, uh, well, also the definition of attack means a course of conduct involving the multiple commission of acts against any civilian population pursuant to or in furtherance of a state or organizational policy to commit such act. In the, if you look at the, um, um, uh, the record of, um, of earlier ICC decisions, this last requirement, the furtherance of a state or organizational policy to commit such an attack is highly contested. Uh, it has been uh, debated from the early days of the court. And that is why if you look at the prosecutor's request for permission to proceed to the uh, investigation, um, the prosecutor actually spends some time looking at statements issued by, uh, by the president, um, issuances by, the, um, by uh, the Philippine National Police to carry out uh, those, um, citing those um, speeches. Um, and um, uh, in, order, in other words, what I'm saying is that when you look at that portion of the request, this is the provision that it is, um, that um, she uh, is, um, is referring to. Also, the, um, um, uh, the, um, uh, the crime against humanity of murder has um, three elements under the elements of crimes. Um, that the perpetrator killed one or more persons. The conduct was committed as part of a widespread or systematic attack against a civilian population. And third, that the perpetrator knew that the conduct was part of or intended the conduct to be part of a widespread or systematic attack against a civilian uh, population. Um, okay. Notice the use of the word perpetrator in the elements of the crime. It brings us then to the next issue. So we have covered already the content of the crime itself. Um, when you use the word perpetrator, we then enter into another area of ICC law, and the jargon is mode of liability. And um, the perpetrator is the person who actually commits the, um, the crime. Um, however, similar to, um, to Philippine law, we have various forms of accessorial 
uh, liability. Um, are those who order, solicit, or induce the commission of the crime? Um, are those who facilitate the, um, the commission of the crime, aids or abets or otherwise assist in its commission or its attempted um, commission or providing the means of its um, commission or in other way contributes to the commission of the, uh, of the crime. So notice, um, when you speak of mode of liability, you speak of the different ways by which an individual can be implicated in the, um, um, in the, in the crime and can be the subject of, uh, of, an, um, of an indictment. The, um, there is also something unique about ICC law where the mode of liability, the, well, we call it, there is no hierarchy on mode of liability. Uh, so people might intuitively say, of course, the perpetrator, the, the gunman um, is the most um, guilty. Uh, there is of course a healthy debate within, with the, with, within the court over this issue. But if you look at the text, the text does not create a hierarchy mm -hmm. among these um, modes of, of, um, of liability. Um, and it leaves to the trial chamber. Uh, the, um, uh, it leaves the trial chamber the discretion to weigh uh, the, the what we call the degree of culpability uh, of the various participants in the crime and determine the, um, the sentence that will be imposed upon the various participants depending, well, taking into account the mode of liability of liability and their form of participation in the, in the commission of the crime. Um, the, um, just one last point, I think I'm now uh, in my last um, uh, two minutes. Um, and, uh, and something which I feel I should, um, I must uh, I distinguish, ICC, the culture uh, in, in the court versus that that we are more familiar with in the Philippines. In the, um, uh, in the court, we respect all the counsels who appear before the, the court. The counsels for the, uh, for the prosecution, the counsels for the uh, defense, and the counsels, we call them the legal representatives for victims. We consider all counsel to be, uh, to be contributors to the, uh, to the enterprise which is uh, that of doing justice uh, to, uh, to the victims, making sure that we end um, impunity and making sure that the accused has the highest quality of defense indispensable to the functioning of an international uh, criminal court. And I want to say this because uh, in, in the, as I'm sure you're all familiar, in, in the Philippines, we tend to associate uh, counsel with the, um, uh, with the, uh, well, with the acts committed by, uh, by, by their clients. At the court, we maintain all the proceedings on a highly a professional uh, level and all counsel are, for instance, and this for me um, is something that I would like to uh, emphasize and to close on, on, on this point. When I was a new judge, uh, we usually have protective measures for victims to make sure that victims who testify against powerful uh, uh, people are safe when they go back, um, when they go back home. Um, and, um, and uh, oh, by the way, and um, also we do fly in the victims uh, to testify to, to, the, to the seat of the court. They also have to, the option to testify online the way we are doing here by a, via a, a, um, a video, uh, video link. But I always worry about the safety of our, of our witnesses. We provide them um, uh, protective um, measures. And, um, but I also realize at some point, even if we keep the identities of the victims um, confidential, uh, if it is on a, a, a video link, for instance, the, um, there would be the pixelation of the, uh, of the images, the blurring of the, um, 
of the um, of the voices. Even if we do that, the uh, accused and the uh, defense counsel, of course, as a matter of due process, are made aware of who that um, uh, uh, that a witness is, are able to cross-examine and confront that uh, that witness. And um, I, uh, when I asked uh, around, um, are we not worried about the safety of the witness? The answer that the, the 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 identity of the witness is disclosed uh, to um, uh, um, to the accused and to the um, defense counsel. The answer to me is, oh, we're not worried about that. Uh, defense counsel are professionals. They have made an oath to the court and that oath will be carried out. And um, uh, for me, that is the culture uh, within the ICC of the highest respect for, um, for the rights of the, um, of the accused, but also the, the highest uh, respect for both the professionalism of all participants uh, before uh, the court in its uh, proceedings and uh, never losing sight of the purpose of the ICC, which is to end uh, impunity. I wish uh, to close on that point and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Judge. We have some questions from our participants. Uh, the first one is, if crimes against in crimes against humanity, what does having a state policy mean? Does it need to be expressed? or can it be inferred from other pieces of evidence? Um, the second one is how can ICC collect evidence where Philippines is not cooperative of the investigation? So how can ICC perform other activities such as outreach and victim identification? The third is if an accused or a principal dies, will the court still continue with the trial? And if yes, what happens to the right of the victims to restitution? And the fourth is as a practical question, how does the ICC implement warrants of arrest, especially when the state has gone on record that it won't cooperate? Um, thank you so much, uh, uh, Paul. Um, these are very good questions. Um, okay, let me start with the last. Uh, a warrant, you see, uh, the warrant of arrest is, warrants of arrest are carried out with the cooperation of member states. And um, uh, so if the question is, is there a global police, a global gendarme uh, by, which to, um, uh, by which the ICC orders um, arrests to be um, carried out, there's no such thing, no such thing in international law in general, and no such thing for the ICC uh, in particular. And so the way you, you phrase the question, uh, Paula captures the, uh, the dilemma. We need the, um, the cooperation of, um, of states. I've got to tell you though, that um, um, we have received such cooperation. So in the last case that I, in which I participated uh, in the court, uh, he was a rebel leader um, in, in Uganda. He actually was captured by, by, by U.S. troops, and the U.S. Um, isn't even a, a member of the, um, of the Rome Statute, but uh, the U.S. Had, um, uh, uh, was um, uh, in, in the state of, of Uganda, um, with the permission, by the way, of the uh, state of, uh, of Uganda, and they, um, uh, the, um, the, they captured the rebel leader and surrendered him uh, to, into the custody of the uh, International Criminal Court. Um, okay, let me proceed. Um, um, I'm, I have to rush through the, uh, uh, to the next uh, three questions. The death of the, of, the, of the accused. Well, this is a criminal case. Uh, with the death of the accused, the, uh, the case is over. But very interesting point. What happens to the, vic to the victim's claims for restitution? Um, it ends with the death of the accused. And that is in fact the, um, the unique nature of international criminal justice. That, um, that in contrast to the other modes of enforcing um, uh, responsibility, like state responsibility, here um, the, the victim's claim for restitution is connected, is attached 
to the liability of the, um, of the accused. So um, uh, we have found uh, ourselves in a difficult situation when a case was um, reversed, Bemba, a politician uh, from, uh, from Africa and, um, and he was convicted on, by the trial chamber. He was acquitted on appeal. But by the time he was acquitted, the victims had all presented their cases already. In other words, there was no question about their victimization. And, um, and the court had to explain, well, so sorry guys, um, uh, uh, you are, your claim for reparations uh, is viable only for as long as we have an accused who is, um, who is guilty. Um, that is not the end of the story though. We have a, uh, what we call a trust fund for victims. And that trust fund has its own, we call it a judicial mandate, and we all, it also has its assistance mandate. So its judicial mandate to carry out the award is over as soon as the, um, as soon as the accused was, uh, was acquitted. But it still had enough leeway under its assistance mandate to reach out to, uh, to the victims. That flexibility is important, by the way, because again, unique to uh, international uh, criminal justice, even if you have lots of victims in a situation, reparations can be given only to those victims actually hurt by those specific accused. In other words, there has to be the nexus to the accused um, himself. And uh, it's again, difficult to explain to victims who say that, well, we have suffered from this uh, situation that you are um, investigating, but, uh, and, and uh, courts have to explain, yeah, but you have to show that you were injured by the accused, that the harm you suffered was caused by the, uh, the uh, accused. You need to establish the causal uh, nexus. Let me now proceed to um, my last uh, two points. Um, I'll try to make it um, uh, a brief. That lack of cooperation, well, um, that has been the, uh, the problem of the court in many uh, uh, cases. So there were uh, politicians from Kenya who uh, were um, uh, who were the charges uh, were who were cleared of the charges by by the court. It did not go into the uh, there was in effect what what we call a demurrer to the evidence, mm -hmm. and uh, they were uh, cleared. Um, uh, the demurrer was uh, was was granted, um, and uh, if you read the commentary, they explained it in terms of the um, the difficulty of getting. Um, um, investigations uh, done within Kenya against uh, uh, the accused was Ruto, a, um, uh, a cabinet um, secretary, and Sang, who is a um, who was a communications um, um, expert. And um, so the scenario that is um, being anticipated by by this question is a scenario that was faced by by the court um, uh, in. Um, in the, in the Ruto and Sang case, and to some extent in the uh, um, mm. in the Cote d'Ivoire uh, case of um, Gbagbo and uh, Blegude. Um, uh, so finally, just on the um, on the question about state policy, whether it, it is expressed or um, or um, implied. Um, well, I think if you read the request for permission filed by the uh, by the prosecutor, she really uh, goes at length to express uh, to to cite many documents emanating from uh, from the the Philippine government to 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 um, identify to establish that there is a state policy. I will not uh, go beyond uh, stating that this uh, issue was addressed in that request. Um, so, Paula, I think I should now uh, yield the uh, the floor. Thank you very much, Judge. Uh, we now turn over the floor to Attorney Domino for the second part of this forum. For the second part of the forum, we will focus on the implications of a full investigation on the drug war. This part will explore more deeply what Judge Raul has mentioned a while ago. The question, what happens now? How do domestic investigations and prosecutions affect the proceedings in The Hague? How can victims participate and be heard? We will explore these and other questions for this part of the forum. For our first speaker, we have Professor Andre Raj C. Palacios. 
Professor Palacios is an assistant professor at the UP College of Law. He currently chairs the International Law and International Affairs Committee of the Integrated Bar of the Philippines and serves as the executive director of the ASEAN Law Institute. Prior to this, he was undersecretary and head of the Public-Private Partnership Center, an assistant secretary in the office of the president, a senior lawyer at the World Bank, and assistant to the Philippine representative to the World Trade Organization. He received his undergraduate and law degrees from the University of the Philippines de Liman and his Master of Laws from University of London. The floor is yours, Professor Raj. Uh, pleasant afternoon to uh, the organizers of this event, to uh, Judge Raul Pangalangan, to my fellow panelists, and also to the uh, participants who are joining us this afternoon. Please allow me to share my screen. In a request dated June 14, the ICC prosecutor sought the authorization of the pretrial chamber to commence an investigation into the situation in the Philippines. Uh, Judge Raul has uh, discussed the substance of the law on crimes against humanity, the procedure with regard to uh, request for authorization to commence an investigation, and also the practice in the ICC. My task this afternoon is to share my views on the possible Philippine legal implications, the possible Philippine legal effects of the next steps in the ICC investigation. So my topic is focused on the Philippine legal effect of ICC possible next steps. I will not be discussing the um, effect under international law of ongoing Philippine investigations. Okay. The first possible step under international law is that the prosecutor may conduct investigations on the territory of a state. This is authorized under Article 54 of the Rome Statute. Normally, investigations will be conducted by the prosecutor with the voluntary cooperation of the state on whose territory the investigation is conducted. Under Article 86 of the Rome Statute, states have a general obligation to cooperate with the ICC, specifically to, and I quote, cooperate fully with the court in its investigation, end of quote. In exceptional circumstances, however, the pretrial chamber may authorize the prosecutor to take specific investigative steps within the territory of a state without having secured the cooperation of that state. This is authorized under Article 57 of the Rome Statute. The second possible next step under international law, specifically under the Rome Statute, is that the pretrial chamber shall on the application of the prosecutor, issue a warrant of arrest of a person. This may be done at any time after the initiation of an investigation as authorized under Article 57 of the treaty. Once the arrest warrant is issued, the ICC may request a state on whose territory the person sought to be arrested is found to arrest the said person and surrender him or her to the ICC. Once the requests for arrest and surrender are received by a state, that state shall, in accordance with the procedure under its national law, comply with the request for arrest and surrender. Now, what are the legal effects under Philippine law of these treaty rules, these rules of international law authorizing the prosecutor to conduct investigation on the national territory of a state without that state's consent. Rules of international law requiring a state to cooperate in the prosecutor's investigation and to arrest and surrender a person when requested by the ICC. Specifically, is the ICC prosecutor authorized under Philippine law to conduct investigation on Philippine national territory without the consent 
of the Philippine government as authorized under international law? Are Philippine government agencies obligated under Philippine law to cooperate in the prosecutor's investigation as required under international law? And lastly, are Philippine government agencies obligated under Philippine law to comply with the ICC's request to arrest and surrender persons named in the ICC warrant as required under international law? The answer to these questions will require the application of a seven-step process of analysis to determine the effect of the relevant provisions of the Rome Statute under the Philippine legal system. The starting point of our analysis is the understanding that, the Philippine, that Philippine law follows the dualist view and sees international law as separate and apart from Philippine law. Rules of international law are not part of and have no effect in the Philippine legal system unless these international rules are domesticated and become Philippine law. As Philippine law, domesticated rules of international law may create legal rights and duties, legal authorities and immunities under Philippine law. According to Justice Brion, in his concurring opinion in IPAP versus uh, Ochoa, and I quote, under the dualist view, the Philippines sees international law and its international obligations from two perspectives. First, from the international plane, where international law reigns supreme over national laws. Second, from the domestic plane, where the international obligations and international customary laws are considered in the same footing as national laws and do not necessarily prevail over the latter. The Philippines' treatment of international obligations as statutes in its domestic plane also means that they cannot contravene the Constitution, including the mandated process by which they become effective in the Philippine jurisdiction." End of quote. So we have to undertake our seven-step analysis, which in summary, we begin by identifying the binding rules of international law that may be applicable to uh, a possible Philippine case. We determine if the international rules have been domesticated into the Philippine legal system, and we also check their effect in the Philippine legal system. And possibly, we may be able to apply these rules in a Philippine case if they have been, if they are binding and have been domesticated. Uh, here is a uh, summary of the seven steps uh, for determining whether rules of international law can be applied in a Philippine case. In this case, a Philippine case that may concern the ICC investigation. Step one of the analysis is to identify the rules of international law that may be applicable to a possible Philippine case involving the ICC investigation on the Philippine situation. With regard to investigations, the relevant rule of international law requires states to fully cooperate with the court in its investigation and prosecution of crimes. With regard to arrest and surrender, the second relevant rule of international law provides that states shall comply with requests for surrender and arrest in accordance with the provisions of or the procedure under Philippine law. So we check whether the, these two rules that we wish to invoke are actually binding rules and not soft law. Soft law pertains to non-binding principles and guidelines that uh, are non-binding but nonetheless influence the behavior of states. So in this case, uh, these indeed are binding rules of law. Second, in our, in our seven-step analysis, is to determine the formal source uh, of these uh, two relevant rules of international law. The step two of the analysis requires us to identify the way by which these two rules were created in the international legal system. There are three ways by which rules are created under the international legal system. First, by international agreement. Second, by the general and consistent practice of states, coupled with opinio juris. And third, by derivation from general principles of law from the municipal legal systems. In the case of the two relevant rules of international law, they were created by international agreements, specifically the Rome Statute. Um, Article 86 
uh, of the Rome Statute reflects this rule uh, imposing a, an obligation on states party to the Rome Statute to cooperate fully with the court in its investigation. Article 89 uh, of the same treaty imposes on states party to the Rome Statute the obligation to comply with a request by the ICC for the arrest and surrender of persons named in the warrant. I also wish to flag this uh, third rule of international law that may be relevant, and this pertains to the possibility for a state not party to the Rome Statute to provide assistance to the court. And there are three ways by which uh, a state not party may cooperate and assist the court. It may be on an ad hoc arrangement. Second, it may be on based on an agreement uh, between the ICC and the state. And third, it may be based on some other appropriate basis. Now, if a state not party to the statute which has agreed to provide assistance to the court fails to cooperate, then these are the consequences. The court uh, may inform the assembly of states, parties, um, as well as the, uh, or the UN Security Council if the UN Security Council referred the matter to the court. Step three uh, requires us to determine whether the treaty rules are binding on the Philippines. The binding effect of treaties is reflected in Article 26 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, as well as in its Article 34. Article 26 states that every treaty enforced is binding upon the parties and must be performed by them in good faith, whereas Article 34 says that a treaty does not create other, either obligations or rights for a third state without its consent. So the Philippines was a party to the Rome Statute from November 1st, 2011 until March 17, 2019. And thus, the treaty was binding on the Philippines during that period. The withdrawal of the Philippines as a party to the Rome Statute became effective under international law on March 17, 2019, and thus the treaty is no longer binding on the Philippines from that date. Our analysis should end here, but we can actually proceed with the next steps, applying it to the period when the Philippines was still a party to the Rome Statute, when the treaty was still binding on the Philippines. To be clear, the treaty is no longer binding on the Philippines. Step four requires us to examine whether the relevant rule of international law has been domesticated into the Philippine legal system. For customary rules, they are incorporated wholesale through the incorporation clause of the Philippine Constitution, where the Philippines adopts the generally accepted principles of international law uh, as part of the law of the land. With regard to treaty rules, they are domesticated by way of transformation under Section 21 Article 7 of the Constitution, which provides that no treaty or international agreement shall be, shall be valid and effective unless concurred in by at least two-thirds of all the members of the Senate. So this is what happened with the Rome Statute. Uh, the Philippine Senate concurred in the President's ratification of the Rome Statute. Thus, the provisions of the Rome Statute were domesticated and became part of Philippine law. The third type of rule of international law is with, is, uh, are, are the uh, rules found in executive agreements. They require only the ratification of the president. Uh, step five of the analysis requires us to determine the place of the domesticated rule of international law in the hierarchy of Philippine rules. On tier one, of course, um, of the Philippine rules, we have the um, rules reflected in the Philippine constitution. On tier two are statutory rules. And also on that tier, um, we will find domesticated customary rules and treaty rules. On the third tier, we have uh, executive regulation rules. And on that tier also, we will find the domesticated rules from executive agreements. So here's a diagram of the, the two hierarchies in the respective legal systems and um, their place uh, in, in, the, in the Philippine legal hierarchy uh, when the rule of international law is domesticated. The sixth step uh, is to determine whether uh, the effect 
of the domesticated rule of international and the Philippine legal system. It could fill a gap in Philippine law um, or it, if it uh, conflicts with a Philippine legal rule from a domestic source, then that will be have to be resolved through the sequential analysis. Or third possibility is that the domesticated rule of international law will result in a reinterpretation of a Philippine rule or it will become an aid in the interpretation of a Philippine rule. And lastly, uh, sorry, this is the sequential analysis in case there's a conflict. We um, sequentially apply the three um, principles, uh, the principles of Lex Superior first, and then uh, Lex Specialis next, and then thirdly, Lex Posterior. Okay. Um, in the end, we check whether the rule of international law, which has been domesticated, uh, and has been checked for possible conflict in step six with a Philippine legal rule, may then be applied in a Philippine case. As we said, the Rome Statute is no longer binding on the Philippines. And so those two relevant provisions, the provision um, um, on investigation uh, on territory of the Philippines, um, even without the uh, cooperation of the Philippine state, as well as the obligation to assist uh, to comply with the request for arrest and surrender are no longer binding on the Philippines. That is my short presentation on the Philippine legal implications of the ICC statute. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Raj. We proceed to our second speaker for this part. Uh, Attorney Roben Carranza, our second speaker, is a senior expert at the International Center for Transitional Justice and the director of ICTJ's Reparative Justice uh, Program. He pre also previously served as the Assistant Secretary of National Defense in the Philippine government and as commissioner in charge of investigation and litigation at the Presidential Commission on Good Government. He obtained his Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Laws degrees from the University of the Philippines and a Master of Laws degree from New York University in 2005 as a Global Public Service Law Program Scholar. Good afternoon, Attorney Carranza. Um, and thank you for having me. And um, I'll try to make this quick and short and let uh, people ask questions maybe now or later. Um, I, 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 I'll start by characterizing the war of drugs as really not just a war on drugs, as many of us already know, but a war on the poor. And it's a class war. It's targeting the poor, most of all. There may be some who are not poor. There may be some from the middle class. But in the tens of thousands that the prosecutor has uh, mentioned as having been killed in the drug war, predominantly, those are poor Filipinos. And, and that's an important factor to consider when talking about the rights of victims and what victims are entitled to in terms of justice at the ICC. The drug war is premised on the US drug war. It's a copy of the US drug war, which by the way, was started 50 years ago this week by Richard Nixon, who came up with the idea of knock and plea, that police should knock and then plead uh, in, in the houses of alleged drug users and drug dealers before they conduct arrests. That's what Tokhang means, Tok Tokhang. And I'm, I grew up in Cebu, so I use that language. And there's a big difference in a way because in the Philippines, people don't have doors, don't have security of housing for police to actually knock on doors for your person to be actually safe. Now, Again, this is a factor when looking at how the justice is, how, how the poor would expect justice from a court, including from an international criminal court. Um, the Raj and uh, Judge Raul, my dean and my teacher as well, uh, already outlined what the prosecutor said in the public version of her uh, request for, uh, to the pretrial chamber to conduct an investigation, uh, I'd like to note that there is a Filipino, a Tagalog version, at least of the press statement that she came up with uh, together with the request. And I think that's a very important point and that's a very important part of what the court does to 
reach out to victims, to reach out not just to victims, but the citizens of a country uh, oh, that's part of a situation before the court. And so I, I will ask you to, to actually look at um, the Filipino version of her statement when she announced the, uh, when she gave out the public redacted version of the uh, request. Now, uh, how do victims engage with the ICC? So there are several aspects and I'm going to just oversimplify them by communicating to the prosecutor. That's what happened prior to the preliminary examination and during the preliminary examination. And some of the communications were done by lawyers, by Filipino politicians, uh, by the late Jude Sabio, who I, I knew he was part of the debating team that I once coached. Um, but they're also done by NGOs, uh, not just by Filipino NGOs. A, another way for victims to engage with the ICC is by submitting representations. And by representation here, it means submitting their opinions, concerns, expectations about the court and its proceedings, including at this stage of the proceedings, at this stage when the prosecutor's request for authorization to investigate is still pending. Um, Judge Raul mentioned this earlier, and I think it's, I, I'll show it to you uh, just in a second, where in the ICC website, uh, representations can now be made. Uh, but another way that uh, victims engage with ICC is at the pre-trial and later stages when they become participating victims. And some of them, some victims can also be witnesses uh, during the trial itself. Now, after a conviction, victims may be entitled to reparations from the assets of convicted perpetrators. Now, um, Ra Judge Raul also mentioned, for example, uh, as an example, the Dominic Ongwen case, Ugandan, former Ugandan child soldier convicted of war crimes and crimes against humanity. So there are now reparations proceedings in that case. One of the things that NGOs, like the NGO I work for, uh, is doing is to actually convene victims in the country where they are, in this case, Uganda. Uh, we, we're trying to do focus group discussion so that they come up with their own views about how reparations in the Ongwen case might proceed. And we are going to be able to submit uh, something to the ICC on that. Uh, I'll take note that the ICC prosecutor has the power to ask the court to freeze the assets of perpetrators even before conviction. I was involved in one case, and this was mentioned by Judge Raul, the Bemba case. And in the Bemba case, Assets of Bemba, uh, former vice president of the Central uh, of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, were frozen, and would have been the subject of uh, reparations had he had his conviction been upheld by the uh, ICC appellate chamber. Now, I mentioned earlier that victim representation is now open at the ICC. So, if you look at the ICC website, uh, there is a page there that announces that the victim representation process in the Republic of the Philippines situation is open. Uh, the, ICE, the victim participation and reparation section or VPRS uh, tries to distinguish, uh, is emphasizing the distinction between representation here as far as expressing victims views of the stage in which this case is in versus representation when there's a trial or even at the pre-trial stage of the proceeding. So there's a form that may be filled out online, maybe copied, maybe emailed, uh, maybe mailed um, by victims, as well as by non-government organizations that represent them. So you can see that there's individual representation or collective representation, Filipinos who consider themselves victims of the war on drugs, can fill out this form. NGOs that have helped Filipinos who have been victims in the war on drugs can also help fill out these forms. Now, imagine how many Filipinos those will be. How many thousands of people might um, seek represent, might, might express representation uh, through this process. In the Bemba case, like, like I said, I was involved in that, there were at least 5,000 victims who were considered victim participants. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Um, it's possible that in the Philippines situation, you'll have far more than what has so far been the largest number of victims 
in an ICC, in an ICC case, the Bemba case. You'll have tens of thousands uh, in the language of the prosecutor, victims who might seek representation, who might seek to participate in the proceedings. Um, QR code, I'll, I'll linger a little bit here. You can take uh, a screenshot of that and then open the form and see what it looks like. So the prosecutor in her request for authorization to open a, an investigation took note of the complex operational challenges that an investigation of the Philippines will require. And um, it's been emphasized by the previous speakers, but this is important. She already took measures to collect and preserve evidence in anticipation of a possible investigation. Uh, in some cases, she asked for judicial authorization to do so and she has used her powers to preserve evidence and protect persons who may be at risk. So preserving evidence, protecting witnesses can already be done. And that means victims already can avail of protection if they are also witnesses. The testimony of victims can also be preserved even at this stage of the case. Um, I'll skip most of this except to mention that victims may be notified specifically of the request or through the victims and witnesses unit that is under the registrar of the ICC. The prosecutor would have also notified those states, and I quote, which would normally exercise jurisdiction over the crimes, which means presumably the Philippines as a state has been notified of the, officially notified of the prosecutor's request for authority to investigate. Um, Judge Raul mentioned that the request was officially filed on May 24, even if the public redacted version was only released uh, close to a month later. Um, there's not a lot of time to discuss complementarity as really admissibility, but this is important because these arguments that the, the case is an admissible, um, because there is already an investigation happening that the Department of Justice of the Philippines is undertaking this reinvestigation of cases involving Filipino policemen. Uh, these are all arguments that can be raised at this stage uh, if the Philippines wanted to, as a state. Can Rodrigo Duterte, the Philippine president, raise these arguments? Not yet. He's not been named, he's not been charged, he's not been specifically identified as a suspect, as a perpetrator, as his, the fact that his president is mentioned, of course, but that is simply a factual statement. Um, I, I will also make note of the fact that there is a Philippine law that domesticates the ICC treaty that criminalizes war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, Republic Act 9851. Now, take note that in that law, the president of the Philippines is immune from prosecution because that's a constitutional principle. Um, that immunity does not apply at the ICC. So that also might become a factor uh, if and when the Philippines as a state or if specific Filipino individuals were to effectively participate in the ICC proceedings. The Philippines has a month to inform the ICC that it is investigating or has investigated its own nationals with respect to the acts that might constitute crimes at the ICC. Uh, there is a possibility that the pretrial chamber might in fact authorize the investigation even before the Philippines can ask the prosecutor to defer uh, his investigation. Uh, but the other option that the Philippines can take is the Duterte option. And you see the quote there. Uh, why would I defend or face an accusation before white people? You must be crazy. I, I don't know whether he said that in Filipino. I think he said that in English. And so here's a picture of the judges of the, the 18 judges of the court, including Judge Pangalangan who just re retired. Uh, but you can see whether they're all white or, or ICC judges are elected by region, not by race. So that's the simplest way to just dismiss this um, you know, argument. Um, it, this is an important example of what might happen if 
a country and its leader decides to participate uh, in an ICC investigation and, and, and pre-trial and possibly trial. Uh, Kenya, and uh, Judge Raul mentioned Kenya earlier. So that's the president of Kenya at the back of the photo. Uh, he's still the president of Kenya. At that time that he was charged, he was not yet the president of Kenya. He was a candidate to be president of Kenya, uh, but he was eventually elected president and his co-accused was elected deputy president. Uh, and at that point, now firmly in power, uh, they were able to stymie the investigation and uh, prosecution of this case. The prosecutor had to eventually withdraw the charges against them uh, because there, was, there were reports of witness intimidation and even the killing of a witness uh, in the case. Uh, the prosecutor at that time said that in Kenya, there has been a steady and relentless stream of false media reports campaigns on social media to expose the identity of protected witnesses and efforts to harass, intimidate, and threaten individuals who would wish to be witnesses. So it's a be careful what you wish for situation. You might end up participating. The state might end up going to the ICC, but that's also the possibility. There's also that possibility. Um, I'll make this quick. As I said, there's a victims and witnesses unit that oversees the ICC witness protection program. Um, for obvious reasons, they don't discuss in detail what that program does, but there have been examples of temporary relocation, permanent relocation, or even so-called preventive relocation that the prosecutor once did, which is now no longer the power of the prosecutor to do. Uh, the victims and witnesses unit also offers counseling to victims and to witnesses. Uh, the ICC itself has to have witness protection agreements with states. And uh, the ICC treaty also criminalizes offenses against the administration of justice, which includes corruptly influencing, obstructing, intimidating, and tampering with the witness. Uh, while Jean-Paul Bemba was acquitted of war crimes crimes against humanity, he was in fact convicted of offenses against administration of justice. Um, again, quickly, there, are, there, is, there, is, there is the notion of an insider witness that might be important in the Philippines situation, uh, but there are several questions that might emerge as this process unfolds. Uh, the threat of self-incrimination and potential arrest before domestic and other national courts. Is that a threat that insider witnesses in the Philippine situation might face? Um, how does the ICC see the culpability of witnesses who may themselves have admitted to committing international crimes? Uh, and there are several other questions here um, that you will see when, 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 when this presentation is um, distributed. Um, the conviction rate at the ICC. Um, I think this quote, and I can't remember now where I got this quote, but this may have come out after the Bagbo decision. Uh, the former president of the of Cote d'Ivoire uh, was acquitted, uh, leaving three individuals convicted and four others uh, acquitted, and then eight other defendants whose charges were dropped. So that's the conviction rate at the ICC. Uh, so there's a there are limits to justice at the ICC, and this is a publication from ICTJ. Um, justice at the ICC is a drop of water on a hot stone. And the Central African Republic is an example. I, I went to the Central African Republic um, to help design a reparations process for the Bemba case at the ICC. Uh, victims had been waiting for all, over a decade for that process to proceed. Uh, eventually, Bemba was convicted at the trial level. And just after uh, together with other experts, our recommendations were submitted to the court and expectations had come up that uh, reparations were in the offing. Bemba was acquitted on appeal. And an acquittal means there no longer would be an entitlement uh, for victims to reparations. Um, this does not exclude the fact that there can be reparations at the national level that there can be reparations from outside the ICC. And that's something that I might mention if I have time. 
Um, so reparations at the ICC can only come after final conviction. Although reparations applications can be filed once charges have been confirmed. That's separate from victim participation applications, although the VPRS, the Victim Participation Reparations Section, has been trying to streamline the process of applying for both reparations and participation. Uh, some victims apparently don't want reparations, only want to participate, while others want to uh, do both. Uh, like I said, the prosecutor has the power to ask the court to freeze the assets of perpetrators. And the ICC, the court, can also ask states to cooperate in the freezing of assets and other means to ensure enforcement of reparations orders. Um, while this is there in theory in the ICC treaty, the question is the capacity of the ICC including the Office of the Prosecutor, to actually do this. Uh, at some point early in its existence, the ICC, in fact, the Prosecutor's Office, in fact, only had two people to investigate the assets of persons who might be tried, who might be convicted. And so it, it has taken a while. And even now, uh, an independent expert review of the ICC, in fact, uh, recommended that the ICC strengthen its capacity to freeze assets, to identify those assets, and to ensure that those assets can be available if reparations were to be awarded. Um, this is the publication that we made uh, on how reparations, registration for reparations, and application processes can be done, both inside and outside of courts, inside and outside of reparations programs. And it's important to just say it simply, that you can have truth-seeking, you can have reparations, that don't have to depend on the ICC. And that applies to the situation in the Philippines. That applies to the victims of the drug war in the Philippines. In other countries, there have been, in fact, steps taken outside of the ICC to address drug war, human rights violations, drug war crimes against humanity, and, and other crimes committed in the course of drug wars, whatever its nature. In Mexico, there is a truth commission for its drug war. Mexican activists have continued to ask the ICC to open a preliminary examination into the Mexican drug war. In Colombia, the peace agreement with a, a rebel group has led to the creation of the truth commission, as well as a special court that is investigating aspects of a US-backed war on drugs that has gone on for a half a century in Colombia. At the US Drug Policy Alliance, has also initiated uh, reparations measures um, for, for black and brown neighborhoods targeted by the US drug war. So um, I'll just mention that the Philippines has had its own truth commissions, one in 1986 by President Corazon Aquino and another in 2010 uh, created by uh, now late President uh, Benigno Aquino III. Uh, the Philippines has a reparations law for Marcos dictatorship victims as well. I think so, man. I'm sorry to interrupt, uh, just a time check. All right. So to wind up, what do victims of the drug war need? They need reparations. They need participation. They need various forms of justice that may or may not be available at the ICC. They need acknowledgement. They need to be remembered. And some of you have taken those steps as well. And so I, I'll end here uh, and hope that this has been helpful. Thank you, Attorney Urban. For sure, there will be questions on your presentation later, and we will uh, ask them uh, during the open forum. At this point, we proceed to our third uh, speaker, Dr. Socorro L. Reyes, uh, who is a Regional Gender and Governance Advisor of the Center for Legislative Development. She is a Policy Analyst, Governance Advisor, Legislative Specialist, and Women's Rights Advocate as well as an international consultant on public policy and governance, social development, and gender equality, such as in the program support for UN women in Nepal and the capacity development for UN women in Pakistan. Currently, she is also involved in a regional research project funded by the London School of Economics through its Center for Women, Peace, and Security, focused on the topic of gender and governance in post-conflict societies. Good afternoon, Dr. Reyes. Thank you so much. And thanks to all the resource people. We really learned a lot from all your sharing. And also thanks to the organizers. Uh, let me share my screen. And uh, 
wait a minute. Um, can you can you just share my screen? Uh, or I, I uh, copied you my my PowerPoint. Can you do that for me, please? Okay, here you go. Um, so my title is EJK Widows and the ICC. What's in it for women? Next slide, please. Well, so far we we have heard a very highly legal discussion of the ICC prosecutor's report. And it is, of course, uh, very riveting, very informative. But when we talk of victims of the drug murders, we also have to take into consideration the survivor heads of households. For every EJK victim, there is a woman who is left behind to feed, clothe, and raise at least four children. She is a mother, grandmother, aunt, sister, female cousin. So if the reports say that there are 12,000 to 20,000 EJK victims, there are 60,000 to 100,000 women and children adversely affected by the extrajudicial killing. And uh, ito yung layunin ko ngayon para ipakita ang, uh, ang kababaihang naging role dito sa uh, to survive the drug war. Next, please. Uh, ito yung uh, magiging pagdaloy na usapan or the flow of my discussion. Uh, una, pagbibigay ng mukha sa mga naiwan. Pangalawa, dokumentasyon ng kanilang kwento. Pangatlo, reparations. Pangat-apat, life goes on, recreating new lives. And panghuling paalala. Next slide, please. Unang uh, kwento, ito, ito ay kwento ng tatlong babae. Una, at, and these are, of course, uh, fictitious names. So the experience is not, but uh, the names are made up. Isa ay si Rosa, at tinawag ko na lola na, nanay, at tatay pa. Si Esther na natokhang si tatay, na lokimia si totoy. At si Ria, sa iyo, sa akin, sama-sama pa rin. Si Lola ay isang 82-year-old na Lola na ang anak ay natukhang at naiwan sa kanya ang apat na ako na kailangan niya na i-support. Si Lola Rosa ay isang uh, ay, ay nagkaroon na ng heart attack so ang kanyang isang mata ay halos pikit na pero kailangan siyang mabuhay. Kailangan niyang buhayin ang kanyang apat na apo. Ang asawa ng kanyang anak ay uh, uh, was arrested, uh, was detained, at uh, guntis nung siya ay uh, inarrest. So ay doon na siya ng anak sa loob ng detention cell. Pangalawa si Esther na ang asawa ay natokhang. By the way, hindi sila usually married, ha? Um, magkaramihan sa kanila ay mga partners lang, um, mga nagsama. That's very common sa kanila. Uh, yung kanyang asawa na tokhang, na iwan ang kanyang uh, apat o limang anak. Tapos isa din sa mga anak na isang 14 years old ay na leukemia na uh, binisita namin. Palagay ko hindi dapat na matay if there's adequate medical care. But yung apat na yon ay uh, na iwan sa kanya at kailangan niyang uh, buhayin at isa ay uh, teenager na nag-asawa na ng isa pang anak na isang natukhang tapos meron pa siyang anak na isang teenager na babae uh, uh, ngayon ay may boyfriend at may dalo pa siyang anak na isa ay uh, maliit pa kailangan padudohin si Ria naman ay isang babaeng ang asawa ay natukhang uh, meron silang tatlong anak yung kanyang asawa ay may tatlong anak sa ibang babae so naging anim at lahat yun ay kanyang uh, inaalagaan. At yung nga sabi ko, sama-sama pa rin. Ito ang mukha ng mga numero ng uh, uh, EJK uh, or extrajudicial killings. Next, please. Next slide, please. Okay. Dokumentasyon ng kanilang kwento. Siyempre, um, ang ating objective ay hindi lang ma hindi mawala, hindi makalimutan yung kanilang mga kwento Kaya merong dokumentasyon at ito ay pinagtutulungan ng iba't ibang uh, grupo katulad ng um, AJK Foundation, yung kanilang program paghilom, yung kay Father Flavi. At tinutulungan sila ng ideals, yung uh, 
initiatives for dialogues and empowerment to alternative legal services, ideals. And I think uh, meron sa kanilang mga nag-join sa atin na nakikinig. Uh, sabi ng uh, program Paghilom, 141 families out of their 223 families had sworn affidavits. And they will continue legal documentation for 82 more widows and orphans on July 1 and 8 nitong taon na to. Ngayon, pag tinignan mo yung mga numero, that is 2% of the 5,281 deaths reported by the Philippine National Police, 1% of the 12,000 reported by non-state actors, and 0.7% of the higher number of 20,000. Bakit ganon kaliit? No? Kasi takot sila eh. Takot sila na mag-affidavit. Eh, paano mo hindi ka matatakot? Eh, pinatay sa harapan mo, dinala, o kaya hindi man pinatay, kinuha, tapos bigla na lang patay na pala, tapos... Uh, kailangan tubusin mo ang kanilang mga katawan sa funerary at hindi ka pa nga makakuha ng death certificate kasi ayaw ng barangay magbigay ng death certificate sa mga ganong pinatay tapos hindi ka pati makapaglamay dahil wala namang kapitbahay na pupunta dahil nga natatakot. So, paano na yun? Uh, ngayon, but, pero kailangan pa rin ang dokumentasyon sinasabi namin sa kanila dahil kasi ito ay truth-telling sabi nga ng ideals para magkaroon ng kwento, yung totoong nangyari sa inyo. At para yan ay hindi malimutan. Kung hindi man magamit sa reparation, sa investigation, ng pre-trial chamber, ng trial chamber, kailangan masabi ang katotohanan at maging aware sila ng kanilang mga karapatan. Next slide, please. Reparations. No? Sinabi nga ni Attorney Caranza, and I'm very glad that I came after him, uh, okay, reparations are provided by the wrong statutes. Uh, uh, pero pag-usapan natin yung time frame, no? Medyo matagal, no? Medyo, uh, sabi nga, eh, yung pre-trial chamber, tapos trial chamber, medyo may katagalan yan. At uh, isa pa eh, sabi naman ng, uh, ng, sabi din ng ICT, wala naman silang pera. So it will really take uh, a lot of time, no? Pagkat, uh, o saan yun, yung sources of funds. Ngayon, sabi rin kanina nga ng ating speaker, uh, si Ruben, uh, sabi niya, well, meron namang National Execution Implementation. Actually, uh, Atonic Ransom medyo nakaka-discourage uh, yung, ano nila, no? yung conviction rate kasi <laughs> marami pa lang naman na-acquit kasi parang takutan. Eh, no? So, ngayon, meron naman. No? Ngayon, ito ang mga tanong. Totoo na meron yung RA 10368 that provided reparations for victims of human rights violations in the Marcos regime. Uh, yon in nagawa nung ano, ha, 2014 at yan ay sa panahon na ni uh, Presidente Noy Noy Aquino and that should really be uh, uh, part of our paying respect to, to him. Now, uh, so... 2014, in 1986 pa si Marcos. So that's 30 years. No? And even if you take in sa, ano, sa Hawaii, yung kay Swift, that was 2011. That was 25 years later after the uh, Marcos uh, dictatorship. So ang tagal no, na, no? 25 to 30 years. Marami sa atin wala na no, no? Wala na tayo sa mundong ito. Sige, pero yung mga bata, siguro nandiyan pa yan. No? Kasi mga bata naman sila eh. No? And ang tanong is, will the next Congress be independent, uphold separation of powers, and promote checks and balance para pumasa ng ganitong batas? At saka, yung bang magiging susunod na gobyerno ay mag-allocate ng budgetary resources for reparations. Remember, yung kay Marcos may pera dahil because of the ill-gotten wealth. So meron yun. Uh, tapos, um, at of course, the ill-gotten wealth is also confiscated by government. And, uh, and, and saka na declare it as a human rights violation. Right? The drug war killings, that have to be uh, declared as human rights violation para magkaroon ka ng uh, law na katulad dito uh, giving reparations. And will the Philippines have opposed the territory regime in 2022? and make a Duterte government accountable for the deaths of 10,000 to 20,000 EJK victims. So, 
uh, talagang ang labanan dito sa national and mid-2022 elections and of course up to the voters. Let's Susan, uh, next slide please. Next slide please. Uh, okay. Pero hindi naman talagang walang pag-asa. Life goes on and we recreate new lives. Natulong din of course ng Commission on Human Rights uh, nag-iimbestiga, nagbibigay ng konting tulong pero of course alam natin na marami din pressure sa kanila. Marami namang mga iba-ibang organisasyon, NGOs, uh, church-based groups na tumutulong. Ngayon, ang Baydani at saka Pilipina uh, nag-o-organize ng family camps, nagbibigay ng monthly subsidies. Look, bago ka naman makakuha talaga ng affidavits, bago ka makakuha talaga nitong mga documentation, kailangan you're, you're trusted. Diba? Hindi naman pwedeng pumunta ko na, no, sige, anong pangalan mo? Anong nangyari? Kailan? You know? Uh, saan, blah, blah, blah. Hindi yung pwede gano'n. Dapat merong level of confidence. And we do that through family camps. Pero uh, dahil nga nag-COVID, ano, nag, uh, so, uh, mahirap na yung family camp. Hindi na kayo makapagkita-kita. Hindi na kayo makapag... Meron din yung program paghilom ng AJ Kalinga Foundation. Uh, yung sinasabi ko kanina, na kay Father Flavi. Uh, yun, meron silang holistic integrated program na merong livelihood, so psychosocial counseling, spiritual support, and legal assistance. Yung nga yung uh, with ideals, kumukuha sila ng mga affidavit, uh, uh, ng mga documentation, although of course takot pa rin ang mga babae. Meron din yung CUTWIP, yung Coalition Against Trafficking of Women in the Asia Pacific, na co-conduct sila ng mga uh, rights training kasi talaga namang dapat Uh, no awareness raising tungkol sa mga karapatan para nga sila ay magkaroon ng documentation din uh, para ma, ma, maingganyo sila, ma, 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 ma-inspire, ma-motivate na magkaroon ng, uh, na mag-document na kanilang nangyayari. And then of course, they also protest, protest action to stop the killings um, for jobs and justice. Then there is also the Paghilom Program of De La Salle Philippines na Uh, nagdi-distribute hanggang ngayon ng mga food bags sa mga nanay, sa mga pamilya na nagbibiktima ng extrajudicial killings. Nandyan din ang PPVR, yung People Power Volunteers for Reform. Uh, kanilang, kanilang emphasis naman ay yung ano, school supplies for all children, uh, mga high school scholarships, microfinance, pero mahirap na yung microfinance, so they gave it up. And then, of course, their insight. Yes. Talk. So sorry yeah. to interrupt, but uh, the time is up, and I'm one yeah. of the unfortunate people that that I'm supposed to. And then, ilang ah, I, I'm already on my last slide. Okay. okay. Malapit na. That ah, uh, sandali na lang. Documentation of women and the Duterte anti-drug carnage. Can you see the next slide, please? Eto yung ah, uh, susunod na siya. Yeah. Eto yung panghuling paalala. The, kung meron kayong dapat na matandaan dito sa aking presentation na ito, sa likod ng labing dalawa hanggang dalawampung libong na patay na, sa EJK, ay merong apat na pung libo hanggang isang dalang libo na tao ang naiwan, mga nanay, mga lola, mga tiyahin, mga kapatid, na babae, bla bla bla. Importante ang dokumentasyon para sa reparations at iba pang legal access, pero mahalaga din na mailahad ang katotohanan, ma-merialize at magkaroon ng mukha ang mga numero ng napatay. Uh, ang katuwa, uh, third, ang katuwag ng mga naiwan ay karaniwang mga NGOs at kamahang simbahan, mga nagbibigay ng tulong, pangkabuhayan, pang social, psychosocial counseling, at iba pa. Napakatagal ng proseso ng investigasyon, trial at decision making na ICC. In the meantime, sa Pilipinas, kailangan natin ng repatriation law, reparations law, sorry na maari nang ipasa ng isang malayang kongreso at pangulong iagalang harapat ng pagtao. And that is, we have a chance, 2022. Hindi ito gawain ng isa, dalawa, tatlong grupo, kundi ng bawat Pilipino na makatao, makabayan, at makademokrasya. At sa susunod kong slide, last na last talaga, uh, yan, we all can do it. Yan, tapos na ako. Salamat sa lahat. Maraming salamat po, uh, Dr. Reyes. So now we will proceed with the open forum. I have collated some important questions. I think I'll start with the national implications as well as the role of regional and other international institutions. 
So for the national implications, I think Professor Raj or Attorney Ruben can competently answer this, these questions. So first, what will be the role of a national human rights institution, such as the CHR, in the ICC investigation? Second, assuming that President Duterte is found guilty, how can the decision be enforced? What are the implications on Philippine jurisprudence? Now, the next set of questions will be on the regional and international institutions. First is what Judge Pangalangan referred to a while ago in his discussion uh, on implementing arrest warrants and state cooperation. So many ASEAN countries are not a party to the Rome Statute and moreover adopt a principle of non-interference. How will this be relevant in the Philippine case? Relatedly, what is the role of the UN Security Council? Maybe Professor Raj can start. Uh, thank you, Jen. Uh, maybe I can try to address the first question, the role of the uh, national human rights institutions relative to the ICC investigation. <clears throat> so uh, ICC investigation can be undertaken even without uh, Philippine cooperation. There are many ways for the ICC prosecutor to receive uh, um, information. Uh, the Philippine government, however, cannot be, is not a party to the Rome Statute and therefore is not covered by the provision of the Rome Statute requiring a party to the Rome Statute to cooperate with the court. Um, so the national human rights institutions as, part, as a part of the government of the Philippine state would also be not uh, covered by any international obligation to uh, cooperate with the court, um, unlike... Um, government institutions of states which are party to the Rome Statute. So what can their role be? Uh, any role that they would play would have to be done purely on based on their voluntary cooperation. I understand that uh, the Commission on Human Rights is an independent constitutional commission and therefore may make its own decision with regard to whether it will cooperate uh, with uh, the ICC. Um, but uh, but uh, there is no obligation uh, on the part of the national human rights institutions to cooperate. Thank you. Ruben, floor is yours. I'll take the question involving Rodrigo Duterte or a Filipino, let's just say uh, convicted and what, what happens then. Um, you know, we, I won't answer that question because it's, it's such a distant prospect right now. Uh, and I think it's important to manage everyone's expectations. Um, first of all, for a lot of lawyers and law students, uh, it's important to disabuse your minds of the you know, to look, it's important to stop looking for parallels between the ICC process and what you've learned in law school about criminal justice. Um, not only because they're different in many ways and many overlapping similarities, but also because even what you learn in law school isn't how the Philippine criminal justice system happens. So even there, you already need to manage your expectations in a similar in a similar way uh, with respect to the ICC, but. I, I didn't, I, I omitted mentioning the Sudan case earlier to save time, but let me mention it a little bit. Al-Al-Bashir, uh, one of the earliest heads of state investigated and charged with war crimes, crimes against humanity for Darfur conflict-related violations by the ICC. Warrant of arrest was issued in 2009. How long ago was that? And he was in power for the long period that that warrant was left unserved, he was able to travel in some cases. He traveled to South Africa and some activists tried to have that warrant uh, enforced by the South African government. It wasn't enforced. Uh, there, 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 were, there was litigation at the ICC and in South Africa over the non-enforcement of that warrant. Um, these are things that lawyers do and, and these are things that might be helpful, might not be helpful, but what led to eventually and in a way accountability for al-Bashir, a revolution in his own country, a revolution that followed the Arab Spring, his ouster uh, by people who refused to leave the streets of Sudan until he was removed from power. So it's not law and lawyers that lead to justice. It's people. 
can be victims of drug, drug war, it can be Sudanese people against an authoritarian leader. And it's not warrants of arrest that eventually will hold presidents and dictators and fascists accountable. You know, it, it's political power and when you grab it. And so Mohammed al-Bashir was convicted of corruption, sentenced to, I think, two years in, in, in Sudan right now, maybe or may not be, let's see, turned over to the ICC. And so in many ways, national justice processes are arguably more important than proceedings at the ICC. So that doesn't answer the question, but that's the point. Okay, thank you very much for that, uh, Attorney Ruben. So for our last question, unfortunately, we are running out of time. This one is for Dr. Socorro Reyes. How long is the process of reparation usually? Given that the prosecution and trial are long and tedious, what are the implications on the reparations cases? Dito sa Pilipinas, uh, the law was passed in 2014, and I know that immediately after the reparations uh, process uh, took off, and uh, some of my friends got it like 2017, that was just three years later. And of course, it's now 2021, and most of them have already gotten you know, reparations. So it takes, you know, the reparations process itself is quick um, nationally. But of course, 1986, when I was Marcos, no, that was 2011, yung, uh, sa Hawaii, 2014 sa Pilipinas. And it took, uh, you know, a, a president who is committed to democracy to do that. And that was, of course, the late President Noy Noy Aquino. If, if 2011, siya na yan, eh, 2010 to 2016. So actually, ang question dito sa Pilipinas is, oh, sa 2022 ba, ano kayang klase na Congress, ano klase ng gobyerno ang maihahalal? That is the question. If we want the national process to really take off. All right. Maraming salamat, uh, Dr. Reyes. At uh, magtatapos ang ating forum this afternoon with uh, remarks from Attorney Domingo Egon Cayosa, who is the 25th National President of the Integrated Bar of the Philippines. He is a corporate and litigation lawyer and a leading advocate for environmental protection, alternative dispute resolution, and human rights. He obtained degrees in law, masters in business administration, economics, and military science and tactics at the University of the Philippines. Ladies and gentlemen, the IBP President, Attorney Egon Cayosa. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, in behalf of the Integrated Bar of the Philippines uh, and uh, the University of the Philippines, we would like to thank everyone who has participated in this uh, webinar. Your Integrated Bar of the Philippines uh, is proud to be working with my, my alma mater, the UP College of Law. And we thank uh, Professor Raj, one of our dynamic uh, National Advisors at IBP for putting this uh, very informative uh, webinar together. It is also a pleasure listening to Dean Judge Raul uh, Pangalanan and of course the three reactors, uh, uh, Tony Caranza, Tony Raj, and uh, Dr. Socorro. Uh, it is very timely that we have this activity the ICC and this um, uh, the developments in this uh, case is a very burning issue. And it is very important for the legal community, our lawyers, to be enlightened and educated about the details of uh, the ICC and its processes so that the lawyers of this country can help explain to our people for them to better understand. Without this webinar, without the help of our brother lawyers, many of our countrymen may be misled by trolls, by fake news, and inaccurate perceptions. It is therefore not only for the good of the legal profession, but in keeping with IBP's program of being heard, being seen, and matters of public concern and legal principles uh, that we do this. So maraming salamat sa inyong lahat. We hope that you don't only go home 
with the added knowledge, a deeper understanding of ICC and the principles of, interna uh, of international humanitarian law, but also share what we have learned so that uh, when our countrymen are more enlightened, they can decide for themselves much better. So maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat. Kinagkagugod ng IBP na makipagtulungan sa University of the Philippines so that we can share the knowledge and work together to be to uphold the rule of law, punish impunity, increase accountability, and we all become faithful and courageous sentinels of the rule of law. Magandang hapon po sa ating lahat. Thank you very much, uh, Attorney Cayosa. Again, we thank uh, Judge Raul Pangalangan and our speakers, uh, Professor Raj, Attorney Ruben, and Dr. Socorro, uh, and, and all of you who attended this afternoon's forum. Magandang hapon po sa ating lahat. Thank you. All the best. <laughs>